Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Nolutando Nematswerani. I'm welcoming you on behalf of Discovery, SAMA, UFFP, and SAPPF. You would remember that since the mid of August, we have been in a new series titled Thriving Personally and Professionally in the Face of COVID-19. Um, this series um, will alternate around the following three major themes. The first one being mental health support, uh, which will include dialogues about the importance of transformation in the environment within which healthcare workers serve. And therefore, it means we will not only be focusing on the need for improved personal res resilience. We'll also be showcasing world-class innovations in care delivery and practice management. The third pillar is really around honoring and celebrating healthcare workers for their pivotal role in leading and supporting the South African public throughout uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. We will focus on COVID-19 related topics to support you on the front line of the pandemic. Uh, you will remember that last week we did have a COVID related topic that we, uh, that we uh, presented to you. Tonight's webinar will be focusing or showcasing the value of innovation in ventilation and respiratory care during COVID-19. I'm excited, honestly, to introduce the team that I'm going to be introducing shortly. But before I introduce them, some house rules. The webinar is CPD accredited. Certificates take about a week to be ready. If you'd like to send us any queries relating to this, please send them to cpd at discovery.co.za. All webinars are made available on the Discovery website under the tab for healthcare professionals. During the course of the webinar, please feel free to ask any questions and use the Q&A button. Please also understand that we do get inundated with the number of questions. Uh, so we try as far as possible to address all of them. At the end of this webinar, look out for the poll uh, where you will be providing us with feedback on how you have experienced the poll. This helps us to also provide feedback to the experts who are going to be uh, presenting today. So this uh, webinar will be led by the Oxera team, a group of South African um, doctors, engineers, and designers based in my home province in East London, who invented from a scratch, from scratch a medical device that revolutionizes um, um, oxygen delivery to COVID-19 uh, patients. So I'd like now to take uh, this moment to briefly introduce them and then play a short video uh, about their story. First up is Dr. Craig Parker, who's a medical officer in the anesthetic department at Frey Hospital in East London, like I said, my home province. Prior to medicine, he studied engineering and spent 20 years working in the mining industry locally and elsewhere in Africa as a mechanical engineer and project manager. He started this project as he felt that there was an obvious gap in the ability to provide respiratory compromised air patients with a solution besides uh, intubation and ventilator support in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. He's joined by Trevor Rousseau, who's a civil engineer who, with extensive industry experience. He worked in the consulting civil engineering industry for nearly 20 years, specializing in water resource, resource planning and the design and project management of water infrastructure uh, projects. He joined Umoya in 2020, April. Um, our last, uh, but not least, uh, it will be Dave Morris, who's joining us as well, who is originally from the UK and an, an Imperial College of London graduate with a degree in mineral technology. He worked in the mining industry for nearly 40 years in a variety of roles, ranging from operational roles to executive leadership. Dave retired from the mining industry in 2016 and has been supporting non-profit uh, organization organizations and social enterprises in the fields of education, uh, leadership, social justice, and nation building. And now he is with Umoya Health. So let's take some time to watch the video. And after that, um, we'll hand over to our speakers. Thank you. We heard the rumblings on the horizon. Uh, I don't think any of us expected the scale of what was to come. She traveled to the UK. My grandmother turned 100. My colleagues told me I was mad, but we'd, we'd invested so much and we weren't sure, you know, whether she would survive this pandemic. But it was while I was in that space, seeing how with all their resources, how much they were struggling, just realizing that we were going to be in real, in real trouble. And on the long flights uh, back here, 
to try and start thinking about, about what we could do. You can't just put up a tent and put people in there on ventilators. You've got to have trained people. And we had massive gaps. Yeah, and that was the sort of bastion of therapy um, initially in the pandemic. Um, ICU and ventilation for the seriously ill. And I didn't think that was going to fix our problem. Take a deep breath. Okay. Fantastic. Another one. One of my friends uh, contacted me and said, "No, look, there's a there's a doctor putting a group together." It's something I've never done. It's a field I've never worked in. Medical field. It's a challenge. I had one colleague here at the hospital could bounce ideas off him, but then really the rest of the team was all people signed up through through Facebook. And very soon we had a team of designers and engineers working on it. Our initial ideas were to use non-invasive ventilation, something that could be used in a ward where you didn't have highly skilled staff and you didn't have um, you know, lots and lots of oxygen. Our first devices were based on diving regulators. Quite a lot of us had done scuba diving and we had stuff lying around and we could play around with it. We had two weeks of complete lockdown. Can't get spring wire, can't get springs made, so I ended up using a welding wire out of a welding machine, sort of make, make my own springs. Really, we'd have an idea you know, in the middle of the night, uh, share it in the morning. Um, somebody would have a design by mid-morning, uh, lunchtime they'd be printing, and in the afternoon we'd have a prototype. I printed some simple non-return valves, and uh, my wife was actually putting one back together, but she put it back together the wrong way around. I looked at this thing and I, I blew through it and I felt, hey, there's a bit of resistance and that's what we were looking for. So for a while we called it the Roxy Valve. So that was incredible. So we were able to then connect it up and say, no, it needs tweaking here or this is, this is not right or let's, let's redesign it completely and start again. Um, you know, that happened a few times. So it was trial and error, but it worked. So it uses no more than a normal bag, so it's 15 litres a minute, whereas your CPAP units, those are 60 plus. I think initially we, were, we expected it to work, but we were taken by surprise about how well it worked. And it's ludicrously simple. There's a, a concept of, of PEEP, when you breathe out, having something to breathe out against. It's all part of helping the lungs to re-expand. I saw dramatic results. I saw patients who were not coping on the standard oxygen masks um, actually get to high oxygen saturation levels in the 90s. So they went from dramatically low levels in the 50s and 60s all the way up into the 90s with that Oxera mask. Yeah, I think we had so little to offer besides oxygen. Our ICU was full, we didn't have enough oxygen ports. So it was heartbreaking seeing people waiting, having to watch their relatives, you know, many of them demise, they're with them waiting. And those first few patients where we saw them languishing at very, very low sats, and when we saw their sats with every breath sort of, sort of just climbing, um, I just realized that there was now a little bit more hope, <laughs> that we had another option, another, another arrow in our quiver for those really sick patients. You know, our dream is that one day it becomes a standard item that you would see in any hospital made by, by a hundred different manufacturers. Oh, it's restored my faith in, in, in people. Just to see how strangers are willing to step up and get involved. How people have given so sacrificially, uh, with no expectation, you know, for complete strangers, has just been phenomenal. To be part of that has been incredible. Thank you for that video. So we'll hand over to Dr. Parker now to uh, give us a presentation. Thank you, Nolo. And uh, thanks to Discovery for, for having us on. We, uh, we're really honored to, to be part of this panel and, uh, and excited to be able to, to share our story. And, uh, and really our, our overall goal is today to try and uh, maybe inspire um, 
inspire others out there with similar ideas to to go out there to get it uh, to get it done and 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 bring those to to reality so that we can start trying to improve the lives of, of the patients we serve. Um, good. So uh, I, I've got a, a bit of a presentation. I'll just quickly uh, share my screen and we can uh, get into that. Um, so right. So we. Uh, we're going to be sharing a little bit of our of our journey, a little bit about what Oxira is about. Um, you've heard the story uh, on, on the video really about how you know, how we arrived, um, uh, you know, how we ended up being together. So we thought we'd we'd try and fill in some of the gaps uh, in the time that we have available, and then uh, and we look forward to to your questions as well. Uh, so the Oxira, what what is it really? Um, uh, it's it stands for oxygen efficient respiratory aid. And, uh, and really, I think that, that really sums it up well. Uh, we, we're trying to be efficient with the oxygen that's available. And, um, and it, it's a respiratory aid. It's not, uh, it's not a ventilator. Um, it's not a CPAP unit. It's really meant uh, to help, um, to try and help patients breathe a little easier when they've got something like a, a COVID pneumonia on board. So the device is, as we said, is, is very, very simple. Uh, it was. It's an evolution of of, of many different designs that we uh, that we started with. Uh, um, our, our original target was a, a mechanical BiPAP system, and um, uh, you know this was sort of an offshoot of that. That uh, and and because it worked so well when we when we sort of tested it, uh, this is where we we focused in our energies and efforts on uh, on continuing with this specific Oxera. And uh, so as you can see from the picture. Uh, I mean, a very, a very simple device. It's, uh, it's based on a, on a non-rebreather bag and an anesthetic mask and a peep valve, and then a housing that pulls it all together. There you can see the anti-asphyxiation valve, the, the Roxy valve that LT was talking about in the video, and, uh, and then a, a harness to, to hold it onto the patient. Uh, the harness is, um, it might look, might look really simple, but, uh, but in fact, uh, it really works quite well. We've had um, amazing feedback of how, how easy it is to use and how comfortable it is. So uh, despite it looking like um, this might be something you pulled out of your undies, um, it, seems to, it seems to work quite well. Uh, the filter is there uh, because of COVID and the fact that we, we're trying to keep the expired air a little safer for the other patients and the healthcare workers in the room. Uh, but that wouldn't be necessary if you were using this for something else, for example. So a filter on the expiratory limb. And the peep valve is, uh, is adjustable. We chose to make our own peep valve because we, uh, we knew that uh, accessing peep valves during the pandemic was going to be a challenge. And, uh, and it proved to be, to be a challenge. We were able to provide um, peep valves into, into one of the other big projects in the country, developing um, uh, COVID ventilatory support equipment. So maybe you've seen that valve on, on some other equipment um, that you might have used in your hospital or, uh, or somewhere like that. So, so that, uh, that in essence is, is really the, the Oxera. I mean, I mean, very, very simple, um, uh, but it, you know, it's surprisingly effective. Uh, so, where, you know, sort of, so where does this fit in? And I think um, if we look at this, look at this table, uh, Oxera fits in in between the, the sort of two resource environments that, that, we, that we see playing out in our country. Uh, so we have the low resource uh, sort of um, environment, uh, most of our district hospitals, um, our clinics, uh, you know, GP practices, community projects, et cetera, where you don't have um, highly skilled staff, you've got regular nurses, regular doctors who understand uh, a little bit about um, oxygen therapy, but, but not enough to to run, um, you know, run ventilators, etc., and uh, and we have limited oxygen available. So you you might have a, a small oxygen concentrator. You might have some cylinders. You might even have a few cylinders in a bank uh, connected together. But you don't have uh, a bottomless supply. Uh, so that's when we talk about low resource uh, resource. What we mean, and in that context, really, the ceiling of care at the moment is a is a non rebreather mask. Uh, and then if we look at the others other side of the scale, we've got our high resource uh, sort of environment um, where we're talking about non-invasive ventilation, uh, high flow nasal oxygen devices, um, as well as then ultimately invasive uh, ventilation um, in an ICU type setting. 
And, uh, and those, as we've seen, require lots of resources, lots of skills, uh, and, um, and lots of oxygen, certainly when you're talking high flow nasal oxygen and non-invasive ventilation. So what we've seen is that the Oxera sort of fits, fits nicely in between those two worlds and, uh, and allows us to, to sort of bridge them a bit, uh, allows us to extend the therapy that we can offer in the low resource environment uh, by borrowing some of the features from the high resource environment. So borrowing PEEP, concept of PEEP is something that is, comes from that high resource environment um, and then providing the higher levels of FIR2 that would only traditionally be available in that higher resource environment. So that's where, where Oxera fits in. And, um, and we've seen them used most successfully in, in exactly where, where we targeted them to be used in that, in that low resource environment. Uh, you know, we, um, that, that's where the biggest benefit has been by, by, by a long shot. Um, uh, we've also seen them used extensively in oxygen concentrator based care uh, where, um, you know, where, where really uh, the very limited amounts of oxygen available with some of those smaller concentrators. So they've been quite effective there in many of our home-based uh, care projects at, and uh, GPs setting up practices from home, et cetera. Um, and then patient transport is uh, something that we've, we've seen them used um, you know, very effectively. In. You know, even if you've got somebody who's uh, perhaps on a high-flow device, how do you transport them? Uh, you know, two hours down the road uh, in an ambulance or an airplane where you have limited oxygen capacity to do that. And so we've seen Oxera is used to bridge patients in terms of transport. Um, and then often, the, 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 you know, when, when, when transport long distances is involved, um, uh, the Oxera has been, a, has been a logical choice in terms of initial management of the patient uh, because of the, the inability to continue high flow oxygen services on the road or in the air. But in our high resource environment, they've, uh, they've been used quite effectively for transport. Uh, so between uh, wards, between centers, but not a, not a big uptake um, because in those environments, you've got other options. You've got more oxygen than you need. And I'll talk a little bit later about the cost of oxygen because I think that's something we don't often consider. But um, uh, you know, if, if you've got... Uh, uh, CPAP available, BiPAP available. Um, you know, often those are those 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 can provide a, a bit of pressure support and, and a higher level of care. So you would go for that. You would use that, and and, and clinicians have been familiar with those devices. So we haven't seen a, a big uptake in those environments, but uh, but there again, transport has played a big role. Um, so we've supplied. Uh, many many devices now. We're I think we're up to probably close to near near sort of nine and a half thousand units that have been sold or distributed, and uh, most of the feedback we've received has um, has been has been positive. People have uh, have have found that they've been well tolerated. Um, uh, patients uh, have have improved significantly in terms of uh, saturation levels. And, um, and that there's been a, a you know, decreased, decreased uh, mortality that they've seen anecdotally from, from these devices. And, uh, and, I've, and I've mentioned um, really the transport role as well. That's, that's been a strong theme coming back from, from users of the device. Uh, but the data has been mostly, mostly anecdotal, uh, unfortunately. We've, um, we've been uh, developing this device in the middle of a pandemic trying to get it out there, uh, you know, to, into the hands of those who need them as quickly as possible. And, um, and so the, the actual studies have, um, have lagged, a, a, lagged a, a little bit behind. Um, I've got a slide to talk to that, but before I go there, just um, really some of the, um, just to highlight some of the, some of the feedback we've received from, from various different users. Uh, Across the board, um, people have commented on how uh, saturation levels have improved. Um, on the right there, we can see um, a, a flight paramedic talking about how they, they had to transfer a patient on high-flow nasal oxygen plus face mask. So, you know, who knows what sort of flow rates of oxygen he was on. And he was only saturating into the 70s, and they had no way of transporting him at those kind of flow rates, um, you know, to from the hospital to the airfield, into a plane, and then to wherever they were going. Um, and he did very well in an Oxera. I 
think at a peep of 80 sets um, where we are up to almost 90% at, at one point. So, so a very successful transfer for them. Um, many doctors using it have commented on um, and how some patients do better on, on an oxera than, than even on a high flow uh, nasal oxygen. And, uh, and, and high flow nasal oxygen seems to have become the de facto standard um, for, for treating patients. Um, I guess it's a little, it's, it's much easier to use. Than, than many of the CPAP units. Uh, patients can talk while they're using it, et cetera. So we've seen a lot of uptake of high flow nasal oxygen, but it does use a lot of oxygen. And for patients needing a bit more PEEP, um, you know, many people have found that an oxera has, has actually worked better for them. We're really excited about uh, the feedback we've got from our district hospitals and our rural areas where they've been stuck with, with, with incredibly difficult choices to make about who, who gets what, uh, you know, if, uh, if I give you high flow nasal oxygen, then I have to, I have to switch off oxygen to, to three other patients because I don't have enough. Or if I, if I, um, if I give you high flow nasal oxygen, I might run out of oxygen and not be able to feed anybody until the truck arrives in the morning. So, um, so that's been, been really satisfying hearing their feedback that they, they no longer had to make that choice because it was a matter of, you know, switching from a, a non-rebreather bag to an oxera and not having to not having to uh, not having to choose who gets and who doesn't get. So so really excited about that. Um, at, at Freer Hospital in particular, there were times when we were overwhelmed with patients in casualties. I remember times when there were 40 or 50 admissions in the night. And we just didn't have space for those patients in the ward. And so those patients had a waiting casualty until space could be made in the wards. And uh, many of them were fine on venturi masks or non-rebreather masks, but, but many weren't. And so what do you do where you've got uh, you know, people everywhere, limited oxygen ports, um, limited staff, uh, and really there, um, the, the oxeras um, really were, were used extensively. So many patients were managed in casualty on oxeras and even transferred to the ward and managed in con continued management in the ward on oxeras. So they played a, a really big role in terms of um, helping to manage those peaks that we experienced. Uh, just more comments about saturations improving and, um, uh, you know, and often it, people were really struggling to uh, just, just with, with, with what was available. So non-rebreathers, uh, adding um, that sort of so-called double oxygen, adding nasal prongs underneath, patients still not saturating adequately. You know, what do you do when you don't have access to um, you don't have access to anything, anything more, um, more sophisticated than that. Um, or, you know, you've got limited oxygen, but what do you do? And so, so having an oxera there meant that they then had something that they could try and use. And, and, and many people did, did very well. Uh, I mentioned the oxygen concentrator environment, and um, there are a number of GPs who out of desperation started um, field hospitals in their practices at the peak of many of these waves when the, the hospitals were full, they had no space for their patients. And, um, and I guess the, you know, the, the sort of the really key thing to, to remember here is uh, you know, because of that snug fitting anesthetic mask, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not rocket science, but that um, snug fitting mask means that there's no wastage, there's no leakage. So every liter of oxygen that's coming down the line is able to be used effectively um, by that patient, or being able, is being able to be delivered to the patient's lungs, and that uh, that made a massive difference in, in increasing the effectiveness of low flow oxygen devices. Uh, we've worked also closely with an NGO uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, and in Zimbabwe, uh, if you think we have oxygen problems, um, you need to talk to the Zimbabweans and, and understand in their country. And in their economy, how, how desperate things things became, and um, Kufema is an NGO that um, has has uh, you know, helped tremendously in terms of alleviating uh, the impact of of COVID on, on that country. You know, in various ways, um, oxygen concentrators and and and, and programs to get um, oxygen out there. But but really, they 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 they've focused um, uh, quite strongly on giving on providing ox oxeras to. Uh, to the various clinics and, and, and hospitals that, um, uh, you know, that are treating COVID patients. And that's, that's made a massive difference. We, we love getting their stories. They're always so excited uh, to share um, how successful Oxera has been and how much um, hope it's been able to restore uh, in the clinicians working in those environments. 
We've been able to distribute um, Oxiris to a number of, of, of different countries, um, and we're excited to, uh, you know, in uh, certainly Africa as well. Zambia uh, provided units into Zambia, and Dave might might talk to that a little bit later. So what so what studies have we done? And um, and this I think uh, most of uh, most of my doctor colleagues uh, that's almost the first question they ask me. So where's where's the evidence? What have you done? And uh, we, the answer to that is that uh, uh, we've done a safety study. Uh, we're busy with a clinical audit, and the, the phase two and phase three studies are still coming. Uh, so, we um, uh, completed a, a safety study on 30 healthy volunteers. When I say we, I actually mean uh, Dr. Alex van Bladenstein and, uh, and her team at Barra. Um, uh, she's a pulmonologist there, um, uh, and they've been, uh, you know, really. Uh, great support in terms of taking this device, having a look at it, um, engaging with it, and saying we we want to we want to test this and see you know does it work, uh, is it safe, and does it work? And so the safety study is is done. We're hoping that that'll be published soon. And uh, and 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 I guess the key takeouts from that were there was no um, no increase in CO two, and there was minimal discomfort and pain on the on the healthy volunteers. So we showed that the Oxira mask is safe to use. On the patients that it's indicated for. The clinical audit that is underway is um, uh, talking to uh, the current use of, of the Oxira, what, what they've used it for, and they've mainly used it for patient transfer. Uh, they're a hospital with uh, you know, lots of resources, um, big oxygen tanks, so they found that um, oxygen transfer has been their primary use of the device, and so they're going to be auditing the outcomes on those, how they, how they did. We've got a phase two study, uh, which is planned um, on, on 20 patients, which we hope to finish later in the year. And then they're going into a phase three study uh, by December, looking at Oxera compared to uh, your standard of care, be that at, at whatever facility is, 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 doing, is, is participating in the trial. So that might be a non-rebreather mask, it might be high flow nasal oxygen, and we'll try and quantify the, the actual benefit of it. Uh, the phase two studies will focus on the sort of mechanics of it, how much pressure, um, you know, pressure um, are we actually getting when we dial in X amount on the peep valve, et cetera. Right, so then I, I guess, you know, ethically, what do, what do we do? You're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and and um, I think one, one of the advantages with the Oxera is that it's, it's not like a drug where you need to, you need six months to, to understand what the, uh, what the benefits are and the, or the potential side effects. Um, you're able to see immediately how it works. Uh, you're able to see if there's a problem with it immediately. So there has been that, that advantage in terms of, uh, of, of uh, rolling it out before phase three studies have been done. Um, and then uh, I think many times you're, you know, you, when you reach the limit of what you can, you can do, you, you're willing to try something new. And as long as it's not harmful, and you can see it's not harmful, uh, we, you know, there's room for the, then for us to be creative about trying to solve a patient's problems rather than just watching them demise. So, uh, so that's driven us, um, you know, certainly myself and my team, um, a lot of the time in terms of trying something uh, as a as a life saving intervention, um, uh, making sure we do no harm, but at the same time um, being willing to try something. Uh, obviously, we have an obligation to continue testing and uh, transparency with the results, and um, you know both positive and negative, and uh, and we commit to that in terms of being open and honest with um, the study results. You know, we've got nothing to hide. Uh, we uh, we're getting more and more positive feedback, but if there's some fatal flaw, we we'd uh, you know we'd like to know about it, um, and we'd like your feedback on that, please. Um, and uh, and we encourage debate and feedback from from all the users out there. So please engage with us um, if you've got concerns or suggestions um, or positive and negative. Please uh, engage with us so that we can uh, we can make this better. Our our goal is to create something useful for our colleagues. Um, we're not we're not out to to build a business and 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 uh, and, and and make ourselves uh, lots of money making medical devices. That's not our goal. So. Uh, really, we want we want to get something useful out there. Um, in terms of uh, maybe just a quick word on on some of the challenges that we've faced, and um, I realise my time is marching on, but uh, 
um, just just quickly. So so regulatory uh, processes are long and costly. I think uh, we all underestimated uh, what what that involved. We were very naive in the beginning uh, about three D printing devices that people could use, uh, you know, at their local hospital. That's 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 just not possible. And I think many of the projects during COVID struggled with them. Um, the uh, with, with that concept, um, uh, you need to pick uh, pick uh, partners well um, because you, this is not something you can do on your own. Uh, you need um, certainly if you, you're going to be manufacturing devices, you need somebody with a manufacturing license, a distribution license, and um, and so you're going to need a partner with people who have the skills that you don't have and the resources that you don't have to be able to make it happen. Uh, public sector procurement processes are torturous, long winded. Uh, difficult. Um, uh, we still, I think, are struggling to get you know any orders out of um, out of out of government um, and and auxiliaries into the hands of those who we feel need them most. Um, so most of that's been done through NGOs or through donations that we we and others have made. Um, but uh, you know, the those serving the poor um, or, or the largest group of need um, are often the ones that have the most difficulty taking up uh, potential devices. Uh, change is always hard for clinicians, so we've seen a lot of that, uh, people sticking with what they know and, um, you know, some people being very reluctant to, to consider something new. Um, and then the, uh, you know, many of the decisions that have been made during this pandemic around devices and things like that have been a sort of a blanket approach to, to try and say one size fits all. And we're a country of, of so many, so, such contrast between sort of rural and urban, whatever. So um, we've struggled with uh, some of the key decision makers understanding that. And getting it that um, you know what Madhuleni needs in, in in rural Eastern Cape is very different to what uh, a big hospital in PE might might require. Right, so so that's it from me. I think uh, over to Trevor, who's got uh, a couple of slides. Um, I hope I didn't overstay my welcome. This one, um, maybe one last uh, one last comment. Uh, we we managed to get some testing done by um, MD Tech. In the, in the UK is uh, probably the UK's biggest uh, uh, device testing uh, unit. And um, they described our device, and if I can just uh, quote it there, as an ingenious attempt to provide some degree of respiratory support without the use of high and wasteful oxygen flow. So um, uh, glad that uh, they saw that. All right, Trevor, um, I think uh, over to you. Maybe you can uh, talk to um, the... Uh, some of, some of the oxygen costs, um, uh, if you want, or would you like me to to cover that? Um, I think uh, maybe I maybe I should cover that quickly. Sorry, we've been uh, struggling with with getting our presentation split up into different parts. But uh, if I quickly, maybe I will cover that quickly. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, I mentioned earlier that oxygen costs are something that are often very underestimated. I, I knew that oxygen was expensive and was logistically a challenge, but I didn't quite realize what, what the oxygen costs were. And uh, we just did a, quick, uh, a couple of quick uh, calculations here based on the difference between 45 liters a minute versus 50 liters a minute and treating a patient for two and a half days on those two different flow rates. And 45 liters a minute is, is quite low. Many of our high flow nasal oxygen units, uh, CPAP units might be 60 plus, as I mentioned. And really, uh, if you're talking liquid oxygen, um, the difference between the two is around, let's call it 750 rand a day. But if you're talking bottled oxygen, um, and that's this is public sector pricing, I'm sure private and, and you know, smaller cylinders, um, uh, you know, you know, the smaller users are paying even more. But you're talking at over 1,600 rand a day difference in cost just on oxygen. So oxygen is something to we need to start thinking more about. How do we how to be more be more efficient with it? It's not a limitless re resource. It's expensive, and we need to conserve it. All right, good. I think uh, Trevor, that is then that is really then over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. Um, that's a hard act to follow. Um, I'll call you up for some slides just now, Craig, if I may. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Moya, the team, uh, how we work, and what we believe has made us successful. Moya is made up of a very small, loosely structured group of doctors and engineers. 
both mechanical, civil, mining, and systems engineers. We have uh, some 3D printing specialists, um, a business operationist, strategist, a metallurgist, a personal health fitness instructor. There are a few teachers, a finance administrator, and an ICU nurse that make up our team. Interestingly enough, uh, none of us are employees. We are all volunteers at Amoya. We only bring in what I could call non-core business speciality skills as and when required. Um, for example, tool manufacturers, injection molding, and then legal, marketing, and financial services as and when required. At the core of the Amoy organization is our mission, and that motivates us and keeps us focused. And that um, mission is to increase the effectiveness and availability of and affordability of healthcare devices for COVID-19 and beyond. We have a very flat structure at Amoya. Everyone can contribute to open discussions and decision making. We don't have directors who oversee and dictate what we do. It's a real open door, so to speak, although it's mostly done on Zoom policy. As we spread all over South Africa, and in fact, all over the world, one of the founding doctors um, that joined us right at the beginning was Dr. Park, who is Dr. Brendan Toy, and Brendan's now in Australia, but he joins us every few weeks to participate in the Amoya journey and contribute to that. So we generally meet online via Zoom calls, and essentially we meet as an entire group for one to one and a half hours, sometimes a little longer, on a weekly basis to report on project progress and discuss new ideas and opportunities. So what makes us successful? Um, it's been an interesting journey and it's been an interesting preparation for this talk to look back and try and work out why we got to where we've got now and how. So what we don't do is we don't develop devices that we think someone somewhere might need. We rather first listen to the experiences of the rural healthcare system professionals as the first step to identifying potential projects that we can work on. Then there's the team. Um, our team's a combination of, call it youthful enthusiasm coupled with experience. Um, some people call us basically young Turks and old farts, but um, I prefer youthful enthusiasm and experience. So our age profile in Amoya is from the mid twenties to the slightly graying mid sixties. And then there's the social awareness. We all have a large degree of social awareness. And as Craig said earlier, it's not about creating a business to make money. It's about creating a business to serve the under-resourced. And then, there's the networking. And this is the one that I've found quite amazing in the journey so far. Um, basically without a strong local and, and international network based from team members, businesses and family and friends, we would never have had the impact as far and as wide as we've had to date. Slide, Craig. Next slide, Craig. And then with a small focused and unbureaucratic team structure, there's the ability we have to turn a need into an idea and then into a solution, and then to rapidly prototype that solution into the development via 3D printing, for example, and then to test the 3D printed prototype um, and redevelop it and reprint it and retest it, take it to manufacturing and then to supply. And we've managed that with the Oxera in a very uh, short period of time, which has led to what I believe one of the great successes for us as a moya. And then lastly, I would say it's the multi-level, multi-skill uh, 
integrated medical and engineering team that we have. And this slide clearly uh, depicts that. Um, on our left, we've got a mechanical engineer, Alex Rousseau, busy overseeing and getting feedback from Dr. Craig Parker and Dr. Jonathan Toy, working in the Freer ICU unit between uh, probably looks like it's very quiet, so it's between two um, COVID peaks. And they're working on our very first BiPAP prototype, which then led us on onto the Oxera. So that's all from me on the Amoya team and how we work and our successes and our success story. And I'm going to hand over to the moderator or to Dave Morris. Thank you so, so much, Trevor. Thank you to uh, Craig as well. An amazing journey, an amazing story, an amazing innovation, life-changing, life-saving. I'm going to bring uh, now uh, Dave Morris, uh, a youthful enthusiast, <laughs> uh, to, to also just uh, share, you know, a bit about this amazing technology that, you know, has been life-saving. I must say I'm, I'm happy that I'm from the Eastern Cape because I see, uh, Craig, that you, you were reaching even the most remote areas like Matualeni. So it's nice to see that, uh, you know, this technology was reaching even the most uh, remote areas. So uh, Dave, uh, from your side, uh, do you have any other products, projects besides the Oxera in the pipeline that you're working on? Uh, not only we do, um, <clears throat> but um, before I talk about those, I'd, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about uh, the, the organization, the Moyer itself, you know, how, how we structured ourselves. Um, okay. you know, I think the video uh, kind of gives us a good sense of how we started. I mean, essentially, we were this collective of info, informal collective of individuals pulled together by this common purpose and, and a set of values. Um, but when we started out in, in early 2020, um, the National Ventilator Project had just been launched, and uh, we thought that was a good platform to help us uh, develop our, our, our ideas. And uh, we made some really important connections during that period. But you know, it really, it very soon became evident to us that you can't just pitch up to a forum like that without a more formal organisation. Um, and if, if we were to be you know, be a participant. Um, ultimately, we didn't actually participate in the MVP, MVP process, um, but, you know, the need to have a proper entity, you know, was still there. And we, what we needed was a vehicle which uh, would develop and manufacture and take to market our ideas and our products, but uh, also an ent entity which we can enter into form a relationship with partners. And we need to do this in a way which will provide benefit to the people who really need these products. And, Remember at that time, Oxera was still was a hell of a long way away. Um, you know, our initial thought really was that we were, the, our purpose and ethos aligned really well with being an, an NGO or a nonprofit company. Um, it felt really comfortable with our personal values, which you know those that brought us together. Um, but the landscape currently for NGOs is it's not great. You know, the challenges of funding and, and sustainability are, are really huge. Um, and it also creates some lack of flexibility uh, for the future. So we, we rethought that a little bit. Um, and our aim is to be around, you know, in the long term. And we want to be an independent organization and self-sufficient um, regarding funding. Um, so in other words, we need to generate our own funds. Um, we want to have a business mindset, but with social objectives. Um, and a social enterprise isn't the class of company that exists formally under the South African Companies Act, um, although they do exist over, overseas. So, so we thought we could create our own. Um, and although we are formally a, a PTY limited, we pay tax and do all the things that other companies do, um, we've elected to operate with a, a strong social purpose. Um, and we're measuring our success, uh, particularly on the social impact that we make. Um, and we took a, an existing PTY company, uh, one of the team actually um, had it, uh, but it was dormant and we renamed it. It's now called Amoya Org PTY Limited. Um, and we reconstituted it so that the Amoya Memorandum of uh, Incorporation kind of hardwires our ethos into the running of the, of the company. Um, and there's a, sort of a few interesting points coming out of our um, MOI, which I'd like to share. Um, 
I think the first one is that you know any surpluses and profits that are retained in the company for, for new product development or for disbursement to organizations and projects with similar objectives um, as ourselves. Uh, we don't pay dividends to our shareholders, um, and nor can there be share price growth. Um, shareholders can only sell their shares back to the company, and that's for the same prices that they bought them, and that's a rand. Um, <clears throat> and, and under this arrangement, share, the, the role of shareholders really changes from being one of being investors in, and, and beneficiaries of the company uh, to one of guardians and ambassadors of the company's purpose, vision, and objectives. And that, that's very different to a normal uh, company. Um, <clears throat> and our, our current shareholders are, are really the group of people who came together when, when the core um, were intact. You know, this is something of an experiment, um, and it's a work in progress. And along the way, we've encountered both uh, cynics and, and supporters um, about this approach. Um, we're learning a lot as we go, and, and we'll see how it goes. But, um, you know, there will be some further evolution over time, and um, we've tried to remain as, as flexible as possible. But um, so far, we have our first product on the market. We've got some new products uh, in the pipeline, and uh, we've paid our taxes, um, and we're we're solvent, which is, which is always pretty nice. Um, you know, the Oxera product was licensed last year and uh, our aim has been to bring it to the market at uh, as low a cost as, as possible, yet still being sustainable as a business. And it's fair to say that there were a lot of costs which we completely underestimated. I mean, we just didn't know about many things. Um, and the cost has actually come out higher than we initially hoped. And sales volumes have been, been fairly modest. Um, but the product sells in the range of 1,400 to 1,900 rand per unit delivered, um, and it depends upon quantities and, and location. Um, but we're committed that for anyone who really needs an Oxera, money should not be an obstacle. Uh, and as far as possible, if you need one, okay, we'd like to make sure you get one. Um, we've donated uh, close to 1,000 devices um, so far. Um, and going forward, um, we don't see a huge sales volume, but we'd like to see this device being available, you know, wherever there, there may, be, uh, may be a need. Um, one of the things that's helped us get, um, get going really is um, uh, the need that we've had this burning platform, COVID. You know, when you're starting something new, it's much easier to get going uh, when you've got this burning platform. Things happen faster, failure is much easier to, to, to accept, and we've had quite a lot of those. Um, but we experiment, we're open to new ideas, and, and we listen to those around us, and, and we're guided by, by, by clinicians. Um, <clears throat> you don't need a lot of capital to start uh, something like this. We, we had a few small shareholder loans right at the beginning, but what we had was a compelling case, a national and, and global imperative, and that facilitated the forming of partnerships. And, and I think we had um, many partners who, who showed up willingly and they showed up at risk, which was, was really nice. Um, working in partnerships, though, it's a huge catalyst. We've had a strong uh, relationship with Garbler Medical um, in Cape Town. And this has really acted as a, an accelerator for us, um, combining their experience and know-how and licensing uh, with our efforts. And I think that that, partnership has shortened the time to market by as much as two years if you make comparisons with, with other companies in, in, in the sector. So what I can say is that going forward, um, our future is definitely going to uh, involve uh, more partnerships. As far as uh, new products go, and, and even your question about um, new products, we know that we can't um, survive alone on, on Oxera. We're going to need some other lines of uh, business. Um, and coming out of our experiences with the pandemic, um, the realities of uh, the inequalities in the healthcare system have, have really been highlighted. And one of the greatest imperatives is this need for access to oxygen in, in healthcare facilities. Getting oxygen to patients, its scarcity and cost has particularly informed you know, some of our thinking. Um, and so hand in hand with this, we've connected as much as we can with the needs and day-to-day -day challenges of, of rural healthcare. Um, and our pipeline of products um, currently under development include a, a few things. We've got some um, new and improved components for the Oxera, so it'll, it'll be better. That includes a new body. Uh, we've got a better 
better repeat valves uh, on the way. Uh, we'd like to introduce a variable venturi into the device, and we're looking at the potential for incorporating uh, nebulization. And these are all in various um, stages of, of development. Uh, we have an empty cylinder uh, alarm in the final stages of testing. Um, it's a simple, really simple, robust, non-electronic, non-electrical device, uh, which should help uh, healthcare practitioners using cylinder oxygen so they know when the cylinder is getting low. We were, we're working in partnership uh, on a project for hospital bed refurbishment and some design improvements to hospital beds, and we've got a similar project uh, in the offing with, with wheelchairs as well. Um, we've also, in our connection with um, rural communities and organisations, we, we hear the need for portable, um, robust and, and reliable small oxygen generators, things of about 50 litres a minute, and we're thinking about the reality of this. It's not that easy, that one. Um, but there's also this need for um, on-site oxygen generation um, at some of these more remote health facilities. Um, and in this regard, we've got a pilot project in progress. We're partnering with Right to Care and the Department of Health uh, to introduce um, on-site oxygen generation at a rural facility in the Eastern Cape. You'll be glad to hear. Um, so these all tap into the skills uh, that we've got, they align with our purpose and they support our business model. And, uh, we're always looking for new ideas and, and we welcome input from really all sources to get new things added onto the market. Awesome, 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 Dave. Uh, I want to ask a few questions uh, from my side. I think there were questions around the price, which you've uh, you know clearly stated that it's one four to about one nine uh, per, 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 per device. That's what you said. Um, and then that price is flat price yeah. uh, both in the public and private sector. So there's no differentiated price. Uh, there's, there, there's, we, we try to uh, support preferentially uh, non-profit organizations, community-based organizations and the public sector. Okay, so... But, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very negotiable and volume is really the thing that will drive the price. You know, If you order one, it's going to be very different price if you order 100. Yes. And then do you have any specific plans? Obviously, you will start in South Africa in terms of distribution, but are you having any plans to almost uh, distribute across Africa? We, uh, we have um, um, uh, sent devices a lot, a lot went to uh, Zimbabwe. I think Craig mentioned that. Uh, yes. We have worked with a mining, big mining company in uh, Zambia, uh, sent a lot of devices uh, there. Um, and again, through, you know, this is part of the networks. So, We've sent devices to Peru, uh, to, to mining companies there. Um, and, um, you know, there are regulatory hurdles which have to, to be overcome in all of these things. Um, but generally in, in Africa, the, you know, the, the, the SAPRA emergency approval that we have is, is generally um, good enough for, for our, our, our near neighbors. Yeah. I'd like to bring uh, Craig back in, um, if, if Craig can just come back. Uh, I wanted to just ask in terms of post-pandemic use cases for, for the Oxera. Hi. Yes, hi. <laughs> hi, Lola. Sorry. Just busy typing a reply there. Uh, yes, post-pandemic, yes. yes. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, yes. Yes. Uh, Lola, so, so absolutely. So the the Oxera mask is is uh, is very useful for anyone requiring higher FiO2 and requiring a little bit of um, a PEEP or, or positive expiratory pressure. So so there are many conditions that would respond to that. So uh, severe pneumonias, uh, pulmonary edema. Um, you know, so so those are just two that that spring to mind. Um, uh, I know that there are people who've used them on on other patients, sort of off label. Um, mm -hmm. You know the, the device is licensed at the moment for uh, for single use uh, during COVID. It's under a special licensing from Sapra. We're exploring full licensing with them because certainly it has uh, it has potential for uh, for use in any in any any respiratory condition that's not responding adequately to a non rebreather mask or that requires a little bit of pee. Absolutely, that's really amazing, and I think I was quite excited to hear. Dave speak about all the other projects that uh, the team is busy with. It's really all about 
improving healthcare delivery, specifically looking at remote areas. So Trevor, um, I think you did touch on who makes up the Umoya team and what makes it work. And I think you spoke about, um, you know, the youthful enthusiasm, which was quite an interesting, uh, you know, way of framing it. Um, any other magic, uh, you know, recipe that makes, you know, the team works so well and, you know, think up all these amazing, uh, you know, uh, come up with all these amazing innovations and ideas around improving healthcare. Yeah, um, I know it's a cliche, but it, it's it's not rocket science. It's firstly listening. Um, yeah, I'm an engineer, and Dave's an engineer, and Craig's a, a doctor and an engineer. And as engineers, um, we live in a world where there are problems. Thank goodness, because if we didn't have engineering problems, we wouldn't have a job. Um, we'd be like doctors with healthy people. Um, so we're always looking for challenges. But it's really focusing on listening what we hear from the rural doctors in the resource poor environments as to what their needs are and, and listening to them carefully and then responding to those needs. And um, secondly, we have, as we discussed, we've got a quite a diverse team and everyone on the team is either retired or and has other, uh, has other interests social interests and sitting on boards and committees and that, or we have young designers and engineers who have full-time jobs. So it's, it's tapping into that, that uh, resource and uh, making the best of it um, and, uh, and having a lot of fun. We, we really do have fun working on these projects and we get a real big kick out of the feedback we get from, from patients and from, from clinicians. So um, yeah. If, if you were to mention one or two challenges that you have, uh, you know, come across, uh, you know, in your journey with uh, this particular device, because, you know, yes, you're trying to solve problems, but uh, you're in a system that is not free from challenges. So you may be wanting to do good, but uh, there may be some, some hurdles along the way. Do you want to share one or two with us? Um, yeah, on, on a... Not on a technical note, but on a personal note, I, I found it I found it incredibly rewarding, but I found it incredibly emotionally challenging. Um, as an engineer dealing with water projects, you tend to be quite far removed from uh, immediate problems and consequences. But when you're dealing in the healthcare environment and you're getting weekly reports from hospitals of people that have passed on, I and other guys on the team um, felt that sometimes we weren't doing enough to save everyone. Um, and Craig was incredibly uh, helpful and taught me personally that, um, that I can't save everyone and nobody expects me to. Um, and the other aspect was that one needs to look after oneself because if you don't look after yourself, you're not gonna be much use to people that need you. Um, so, yeah, wow. a personal note. Wow, wow, Trevor. Trevor, Craig, Dave, what an amazing job that you've done. Thank you for this amazing innovation. You definitely have made a difference in other people's lives. You may not know everyone that you've saved, but those families who have benefited from your innovation have their loved ones, you know, uh, with them today. Without this device, some of them would have lost their lives. So just a big thank you on behalf of all of us and really an amazing innovation. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. I just wanna thank you. Remember there's a poll that you need to just um, complete before you, you leave us. And on behalf of uh, you know, Discovery, again, Sama, UFFP and SAPPF, just wanting to thank you and uh, have a good night.